Good morning. Welcome to the Share Series Monday Management Update. I am Frank Candido, and I have the pleasure of speaking with Ken Dontremont, CEO at Medexis, and Marcel Conrad, CFO at Medexis. As a reminder, please use the question button at the top of the video player to submit questions. Ken. Thank you, Frank. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, present uh, Medexis uh, here to you this morning. Uh, Medexis is uh, traded on the TSX under the ticker symbol uh, MDP and on the OTCQX under the uh, ticker symbol MEDXF. Let me just go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is our forward-looking statement. Uh, our forward-looking statement can be found on our website at Medexis.com. Dot com, along with uh, lots of other uh, useful information for investors. So let's go to the next slide and we'll start to describe uh, the company. You know, in, in a nutshell, Medexis is a commercially focused uh, pharma company uh, with over 100 million in revenue, producing you know over 16 million dollars in uh, positive EBITDA. Uh, we're very much focused on the commercial aspects of the business. Um, we're not an R&D company. We are really a commercially focused uh, organization taking uh, either near stage or existing molecules to market uh, and driving uh, revenue. Uh, we've got a really good uh, uh, compound annual growth, about 25%. Uh, that's spread across 17 different products in both US and Canada. Uh, four or five of them really drive probably about 70 or 80% of the revenue. Uh, the real, I think, you know, attraction of this business for investors is that uh, a lot of the hard work has already been done. You know, clearly we've already built out the uh, commercial infrastructure, both U.S. and Canada. So, you know, now as we add additional products or grow our product organically um, at a 60% gross margin, uh, a lot of that uh, value drops to the bottom line and uh, obviously creates a very, very good return. Uh, management uh, is very much aligned uh, with uh, shareholders, uh, owns uh, about 10%. Let's go to the next slide and we'll talk about the, um, the business strategy. As I mentioned, you know, we are uh, a commercially focused uh, pharma company. Um, we're very much focused on organic growth of existing portfolio. Uh, we've done that successfully over the past four or five years with a compound annual growth of about 25%. So we're really, really focused on driving existing portfolio. Um, we build that portfolio through business development, either licensing or M&A. Uh, and so the portfolio that's been put together today that has been licensed or acquired, uh, and we will continue to do that uh, in the therapeutic areas that we're interested in, places where we have infrastructure uh, and sales force. And so we'll keep layering products on top of existing portfolio uh, that will obviously create uh, a good return for shareholders. Uh, I mentioned that we do not do uh, basic research. We do some product development. Uh, and in our hands, that means uh, taking existing products, uh, doing research when necessary to improve the labeling uh, that will create a better commercial opportunity uh, for those products. So when you look at our R&D line, there is some spending there. Uh, it's not uh, significant, uh, but there is some work going on to improve label on several different product fronts. So let's go to the next slide. I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, product portfolio that we uh, currently have. Uh, we're focused in certain therapeutic areas where we don't need a big commercial footprint. So we're really interested in places where it's uh, either orphan drug, rare disease, or a small uh, commercial footprint uh, can assess a significant uh, market opportunity. So the areas that we're interested in is a hematology, where we have uh, a couple of products, uh, Xfinity, which is for hemophilia B, that's commercially launched uh, in the U.S. Uh, and is one of our top products. Uh, we're working on a pediatric indication uh, for that same drug that will expand uh, the label uh, and the commercial opportunity uh, in the U.S. Uh, Trio sulfate is in the same sort of space. That's a conditioning agent to be used prior to stem cell transplantation. We have that product launched in Canada uh, in the last uh, year or so, uh, and we are moving through the process uh, with the FDA uh, for the uh, U.S. approval. 
Uh, in rheumatology, we have a product called Resuvo, or it's called Metalject in Canada. It's simply the same product, different brand name, uh, commercially uh, available. Uh, and at this stage, it's mature in the U.S. It holds about an 80% share uh, in the market where it participates. It's uh, used for uh, rheumatoid arthritis. In the same space, we have a product called TriSpan, which is commercially available in the U.S., in, in Canada, excuse me, uh, and hope to have that available uh, soon in the U.S. In the rare disease space, we have a product called Gliolan, uh, which is for glioblastoma tumors, the most common form of cancer, a brain tumor, uh, where it's commercially available uh, in both the U.S. and Canada. Uh, and our partner is working on additional indications uh, for that drug, which will be a pipeline opportunity. And then finally, uh, in Canada, uh, we have a slightly larger uh, footprint in the uh, Salesforce commercial uh, uh, facing uh, organization uh, where we all actually call on primary care. So we have a uh, product called Rupal, which has done extremely well over the five or six years it's been in the market, uh, growing extremely strongly and continues to do so. Uh, we're adding a product called Turbinafine, which is for nail fungus, uh, which we think will be available uh, in the coming year. So a nice, strong portfolio of products that uh, we believe will continue to fuel uh, organic growth uh, into the future. Uh, next slide, please. So this shows our, our financial results, uh, which we've had, uh, you know, in the last uh, five or six years. You can see we have really strong uh, compound annual growth. Uh, you can see the most recent quarter was uh, $31.6 uh, million in revenue, producing $6.6 uh, million of uh, positive EBITDA. So that's uh, seven quarters of, of positive EBITDA. The last two quarters, it's uh, been positive uh, net uh, cash flow. So we really are now starting to see the acceleration of this business, uh, but still significantly undervalued with respect to our peers, where our EV to revenue is less than one. Uh, our EV to adjusted EBITDA is less than five. So in comparison to our peers, uh, you know, we've got uh, a lot of uh, room to grow this business in terms of the share price. And next slide, please. So if you have more information, uh, you can talk to myself or, or Marcel Conrad, our CFO, uh, and Frank Candido, who's on the line today, uh, also has lots of information uh, for, for shareholders. So happy to take any questions that uh, any investors might have. Frank, I can't hear you. There we go. Perfect. Okay, there are a number of questions. Um, so I'll start. You just announced a significant record Q1 a week ago. Where do you see Medexis in the next few years in terms of driving revenue growth? Yeah, uh, we don't give any forward guidance. Uh, what we do obviously, you know, expect that we will continue to strong uh, to grow strongly organically. Uh, we've got several good opportunities. Uh, Glioland is a product that we recently uh, relaunched in the U.S. Uh, we we acquired that from from someone who um, didn't drive it as far as it can go. Uh, so last September, we relaunched it. We're starting to see some traction there. Uh, so that's going to make a significant difference. Uh, we've got a pediatric indication we expect coming through for Xfinity. Um, so we, we've got lots of growth opportunities uh, on top of a pipeline uh, of products uh, like triosulfan, like terbinafine, so we do expect that we'll continue to have, you know, strong uh, organic growth. Uh, plus, we will obviously continue to do business development to build a portfolio. I think that's really where we get a lot of our value, where we can, you know, take products uh, in the therapeutic areas where we already have sales force uh, and leverage that sales force by adding more products. You know, then the revenue goes up strongly, good gross margin products, 60% plus, uh, so a lot of that drops to the bottom line because we don't need to add a lot of uh, uh, incremental spending uh, as we're adding uh, that revenue. So, you know, that's really how we see the business evolving. Uh, and that's really what's been happening uh, up until this point. 
Okay, next question. Um, it seems that you have a fairly equal split of field staff in both Canada and the United States. Um, yet you re your revenue is currently uh, largely being driven by the United States. So can you explain why this breakdown? Yeah, the you know, we just have a, a broader portfolio of products uh, in Canada at this point. Uh, and so that, that's why we have you know more salespeople uh, per capita. Um, but the revenue growth, a lot of it's coming from the US as we've been building portfolio. Uh, and so we would expect that the U.S. is going to continue to grow. You know, eventually it ought to be like a 90-10 split. Um, but, you know, right now the Canadian business is very strong. You know, we've got some very, very good product opportunities, a much broader portfolio. Uh, we're trying to continue to build a portfolio in the U.S., and that's where a lot of our growth is going to come from. Okay, the next question is sort of an extension of the previous question. If you were to add any products to your current portfolio, would this require a significant bump up in staffing needs? No, I, I think that's the beauty of our business. You know, as I said in my comments with the slides, the, you know, we've already got the infrastructure built out. You know, we're, we're about 100 people uh, in the two territories. Uh, and so as we add products uh, in the U.S. and Canada, uh, uh, in therapeutic areas where we're already participating, uh, then, you know, we don't need to increase uh, staff uh, to launch those products. You know, perhaps we add a few here and there, uh, but you don't have to build a whole sale, new sales force in order to uh, launch that new product. So I think that's where the leverage comes. So, you know, we, we've got, you know, these people in place. Uh, we add a product to either hematology or rheumatology or rare disease. Uh, then we can use that infrastructure that's there leverage that uh, and really, you know, generate significant uh, incremental EBITDA. Okay, um, the next question is in reference to trio sulfans. So there are a few uh, questions on this. So I'm going to try to consolidate them all into one. Um, I've read about the resubmission of trio sulfan in the United States to the FDA. Um, can you give us some additional color? Um, in addition to that, uh, what's causing the long timeline for the MEDAC resubmission if the FDA didn't require any new studies? And then lastly, um, what is the market potential in terms of revenue for this drug? Okay. Um, you know, let's start with that point first. I mean, you know, why are we putting so much effort uh, into triosulfan? Uh, it, it's a great drug. There's strong, strong need for this drug in the marketplace. Uh, if people are following our story, uh, they would have seen, you know, a month ago, we put out uh, some information about a study that Princess Margaret Hospital in Toronto uh, had uh, conducted. Uh, and that study uh, demonstrated a 30% improvement in overall survival at 12 months. Uh, for patients uh, using triosulfan uh, instead of busulfan, which is a competitive product. So fantastic improvement in overall survival. So there's there's a strong clinical need for the product. That's why, you know, we are putting so much effort into uh, trying to get triosulfan to the U.S. market. Uh, we were successful in doing so in Canada. Uh, Medexis uh, filed the product and managed the uh, application, uh, got expedited review, and it was approved within six months. Uh, in the U.S., uh, it's our partner, uh, Medac, who is managing the file, and unfortunately, uh, they received a CRL, uh, which requests additional information. Uh, the request is for additional information related to the already, you know, uh, 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 concluded uh, pivotal uh, phase three study. Uh, but that study was 570 patients, so it was a pretty big study for this space. Uh, and the FDA is simply asking for additional information related to each one of those patients. And so it takes a long time to collect all of that information. Uh, as the question, you know, the, the question suggested, uh, they didn't ask for a new clinical study. Uh, and so that's not necessary, which would take even more time. Um, they're simply asking for additional information uh, related to that particular study. Uh, MEDAC is in the process of collecting in information. Uh, I think we said publicly a couple of weeks ago that we do believe it will go in in the first half of uh, calendar 24, and then it'll be up to the FDA to uh, make a decision, we hope, and uh, that would likely take uh, about six months after we refile. 
Okay, um, the next question is, why does Medexa seem so undervalued with your continued performance in the past few quarters? Um, are there any risk factors affecting the stock performance? Uh, great question. So I'll, I'll start the, the answer to that question and I'll pass it over to uh, Marcel Conrad, our CFO. So, you know, I think we are significantly undervalued. Uh, there's been some overhang on the stock. Uh, our financial performance has been excellent. You can see, you know, the consistent growth quarter after quarter, uh, both revenue and EBITDA and now free cash flow. So we're building cash, uh, but there's been a bit of an overhang with respect to a convertible debenture that uh, we have in place. And I'll let uh, Marcel speak to that. Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, if you look at the balance sheet side of the house, we have uh, two main positions. Uh, we've just refinanced uh, our uh, our term loan and a small ABL with uh, with BMO, Bank of Montreal. That's a $38.5 million facility at, at fantastic rates. We are well below 10%, and uh, we're really proud to have a partner that is uh, believing in Medexa, the Medexa story long term. Now, at the same time with that facility, we got a $20 million uncommitted accordion. Why is that important towards the ventures? We have, uh, as Ken mentioned, the, the venture uh, facility mat maturity coming up mid-October. It's a five-year-old matur maturity, uh, 42 million Canadian dollars at a 25% premium. What we're expecting to settle in mid-October is roughly $38 million, uh, 30, 30, 38 million US dollars uh, as a payment. Now we have an option to pay this uh, facility uh, this debenture facility in cash, in shares, or a combination of that. Yeah. So, so this is the, the little bit of the overhang we were talking about, basically how and when we're going to settle this uh, this facility. Uh, so, as I mentioned, we have the twenty million dollar and committed accordion with Bank of Montreal, where we talk to the bank about as we speak, and we've publicly disclosed our cash position already as a little bit of an outlook that we're trending towards twenty million dollars of cash ourselves. So, with the combination of two of the two. We think we have a good chance to address uh, the majority of these debentures in cash, which is obviously a preferred way of of uh, of, of payment, uh, as we don't really want to dilute our shares. So this is the debenture maturity that is coming up mid October, thirty eight million dollars in cash or shares or a combination there. Okay, thank you, Marcel. Um... The uh, last question, again, I'm consolidating from a couple of questions, uh, pertains to um, a, a, a potential uplisting to a NASDAQ listing. Um, as, uh, as you know, we are currently listed on the big board in Canada on the TSX and listed in the United States on the OTCQX. Um, so there are a number of shareholders wondering or potential shareholders wondering if there are plans for a, a NASDAQ listing. Uh, yeah, 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 Frank. So that's a that's a good question we've been getting the last, I would say, probably two years. And for those who've been following the story for now a couple of years, the story actually hasn't changed. Even two years ago, before we got the CRL for Triosulfan, we publicly said that we want to do a NASDAQ listing, uh, getting from the TSX as a dual lister into NASDAQ. The, the plan uh, before we got this URL was exactly that. We, we've been starting the application. We're very, very close. We don't have much to do uh, in, in order to complete the application. The plan is still there uh, to, to go to NASDAQ. We are just waiting a little bit uh, on, a, on, a, on a catalyst. We, we, we've always said that just for the NASDAQ listing by itself, we would like to have a catalyst with it. And as Ken mentioned before, we have a number of things that are coming up, uh, including obviously the triosulfan uh, resubmission. So we're looking for a catalyst, but overall that's still the goal and we'll, we're still pursuing that goal and we're not really far away from it yet. Okay, thank you, uh, Marcel. Um, I think that wraps it up in terms of the questions. Um, so thank you again for joining us today. Up next is um, on share is Security Matters at 9 a.m., which is in about 10 minutes. Thank you once again.